Have you ever felt like what God asked you to do was kind of crazy? Like maybe you read an instruction in the Bible and were like, um, that's really weird. I know that's how I would have felt if I was the guy in the story that we're gonna look at today. I'm guessing you'll be with me on this, but you'll have to stick around for us to find out. Well, what's up, Bible nerds? I am so glad that you're here, and I'm excited to jump back into the biblical narrative, the big story of the Bible, and look at another familiar part with hopefully a new lens. Because what all of us as Bible nerds know is that to read the Bible wisely, we remember that Jesus is king and context is everything. Reading the Bible through this lens helps us realize that the whole Bible is a story that's meant to lead us to Jesus and invite us to become more like him. So with your Bible nerd glasses on, let's dive in. The story we're looking at today is actually pretty wild. It's the story of Joshua and the walls of Jericho. Now, I remember watching the VeggieTales episode about this as a kid. Yes, the classic version of VeggieTales, not this new Netflix garbage. Yep, you heard me say it. In this particular episode, one of the things that I remember most clearly is that the veggies of Jericho stood up on the walls and literally dumped truckloads of purple slushies on the heads of the Israelite veggies as they walked around the walls of the city. It was a really goofy depiction of what the real Israelites probably had to endure to obey the instructions that God gave Joshua. What were those instructions? I'm so glad you asked. We are gonna read from Joshua 6 to find out. It says, now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go out or in. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king and all of its strong warriors. So you and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you'll march around the town seven times with the priests blowing the horns. When the priests give one long blast on the ram's horn, all the people should shout as loud as they can. Then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight in to the town. Really weird battle plan, right? Like, let's put the pastors in the front and let's give them horns to draw attention to this weird thing that we're doing. Oh yeah, and on the last day, right before we charge in, we're gonna scream at the top of our lungs and the walls are gonna come crashing down. What was the point of that strategy? What, what we need to remember is that God has been inviting the Israelites again and again and again, since he rescued them from slavery in Egypt, to trust him, to put their faith in him. What did that mean for the Israelites then? And what could that mean for us now? Well, what you need to know about faith is that it is trust based on evidence that leads to obedience. To help me understand this, I think of the friends and the mentors that I have in my life and how I grew to trust them based on the evidence of the times when they showed up for me, when they had my back, or they did something to demonstrate that they really care about me. As a result, I am willing to take their advice, to do what they tell me to do. That's trust based on evidence that leads to obedience. And the really good news is that God is more trustworthy than anyone or anything else. Why can I say that? Because God is consistent. The scripture tells us that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. So what's true about God will always be true about God. And listen to this description of his character in Exodus 34. This is how God introduces himself. It says, the Lord passed in front of Moses calling out Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I'm slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. 
I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations, and I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. This is who God revealed himself to be to the nation of Israel. And then he backed it up again and again by rescuing them from slavery, by parting the Red Sea and protecting them, by providing food and water for them in the wilderness, and by staying faithful to them, even when they turned their backs on him. He was so incredibly patient and present with them, even when they let their fear hold them back in the desert for 40 years. That is a lot of evidence, y'all. So even though this battle plan was weird and crazy, God was inviting his people once again to have faith, to trust him based on all of the evidence enough to obey his instructions. And guess what? They actually did. The author of Hebrews puts it perfectly when he describes what happens in chapter 11. He says, it was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. And God invites us to do the same. No, maybe not march around some walls and scream really loud, but to follow the example of the Israelites' faith and choose to trust and obey God, even when what he's asking us to do seems crazy. Honestly, think about how crazy it sounds that God's plan to save the entire world was to come as a human baby, to grow up and mature like everyone else, and then to overcome death by dying. Like what? Can you imagine hearing that? Can you imagine Jesus growing up and knowing that that was the plan? Like, okay, dad, the plan is to defeat death by dying. Got it. Even with all the evidence that we have about God's character and love, it's still hard to trust him sometimes. As Jesus was preparing to face his brutal execution on the cross, he prayed, and asked God if there was another way to accomplish the mission. And if that there was another way, that the suffering he was about to go through could pass by him. But he followed up that request with submission. He says, Father, not what I want, but what you want. Let that be what happens. He trusted his father and therefore was obedient to him, even to the point of death. Our salvation was and is accomplished by faith. So what can we do? Well, we do what Jesus did. We choose to trust God and demonstrate our trust by doing what he says. So two ideas for you this week. Thing number one, remind yourself that God is trustworthy. Maybe you need to remind yourself of the evidence that you have of God's trustworthiness in your life. All you have to do is, is get a journal and honestly just start writing a list of the ways that you've seen God show up in your life. When has he helped you at school? How has he worked in your family? What about in your friendships? Seriously, sit down and make a list this week and just remind yourself of all of the reasons that you have to trust him. And, and then what do you do with that? What do you do after we remind ourselves that God is trustworthy? Well, then we take that step of obedience. Maybe you've felt like God has been prompting you to forgive that friend and reach out to them again. Maybe you felt like the Holy Spirit was telling you to invite someone to church or to confess to your parents that thing that you've been hiding so that they can help you. Do it, take that step. And as you take steps of obedience, you'll realize even more that you can trust God because you'll gain more evidence as you walk in obedience, because you'll realize that he is faithful to you with every step. With all that being said, I am really excited for the opportunities that we will have to trust God this week. I promise that they're coming. So if there's anything that I can be praying for you for, drop it in the comments below because we would love to pray with you. But until next time, my friends, keep on reading and stay nerdy.